119, verses 1 through 2, says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies, and that seek him with the whole heart. I praise God for spiritual understanding. For the, for the last two weeks, I've been dwelling in uh, Revelation 3. Uh, speaking about the Laodicean church. And the, the, the key uh, in there is he that has an ear to hear, let him hear. And uh, I thank God uh, for giving me an ear that, uh, that those verses is talking about me and not everybody else. I've had an experience, I, I, I feel like I'm a Christian for the first time, type of experience. And, and it's, it's interesting, uh, with the quote for today, uh, when those who profess to serve God follow Christ's example, practicing the principles of the law in their daily life, when every act bears witness that they love God supremely and their neighbor as themselves. You know, there's uh, so much truth in the Bible, it's unmeasurable. But the truth that uh, we do possess must equate or be equal to the to the love that we have for God and for each other. And then in the uh, scripture today, blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. Jeremiah 29 13 says, when we seek God with all our heart, then we'll find him. I feel like for the first time, I'm seeking God with all my heart. And if you don't seek him with all your heart, you won't find him. And you'll have truth, but it won't equate into the life. And I, I love everybody here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and that's what the law is. It's the law of love. It binds us. To where, as God's will is in her own in heaven, it is on earth, and that's what I thank God for. God bless you all.
not really part of the scripture this morning, but I really like it's the just shall live by faith. It's the back of two verse four. Our scripture this morning is about the lack of two two. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on the tables that he may run that read it. Let's kneel as we seek the Lord in prayer, and if you would, keep your prayer requests a moment in your thinking as we seek the Lord. Merciful Heavenly Father, our Creator God, we praise you for all the blessings we receive at your hands each day. We praise you for the wonders that we see in our world and in our universe that points to you as the Creator. We pray for forgiveness for our sins individually and collectively. We thank you for your grace. Toward us. We pray for this congregation. We pray for our pastor as he breaks the bread of life to us today. We pray for this community, for our state, our nation, and this world. Go back to Vincent's tribe so that we may spread the good news of your grace, your love, and your unwillingness that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We know that not all will. Please touch the hearts of those that are honest and hard and willing to follow you. And keep us in your, hold us in your hand that we may not fall. These things we pray in Christ's name. church budget. The Lord has blessed us. And as we get back to the Lord that which he has given us, he will continue to bless and to prosper us. This is our prayer. The deacons come forward. Loving Father, we're thankful for this opportunity to return to you a portion of the many blessings you've given us. And we pray that you will bless this offering, multiply it like you did the loaves and the fishes, that your work may continue in this community. It is our prayer in Christ's name. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. 
It was a beautiful day, isn't it? Yes, sir. We, uh, this week we've talked about uh, Revelation and Daniel. And a, you can turn me down just a little bit when I say it. I think he's there. A little bit. Uh, but we've talked, uh, we've talked about a lot of different prophecies, and I really enjoyed the prophecies. And we'll come back again probably around mid-October and do some more of them and talk about other prophecies that are out there that maybe not as well known but quite interesting. So I want to continue with some Revelation but I because I, I'm kind of like Walter I really love the book of Revelation and going through it is a lot of fun and uh, well today I thought I would look to and see what John saw and well let's we'll go through it and mostly chapter 5 I believe Got to switch classes. Can't read that far away from stuff. So, I, like I say, I'm sure you, uh, if you're like me, you love reading it. I love spending time in the book. And I'd say, the problem is nowadays too many people don't like reading the book of Revelation. You know, they, they see it as a book that's sealed, that, that they shouldn't open, that no one can understand. And the problem is that most people misunderstand it or just ignore it altogether. And because it is difficult to understand at times, many people turn away from it. And they choose not to study this book, but like Walter said, he, he was reading through uh, Revelation 3, and they were told that if we just study and look for the wisdom, God will give us the understanding. That's one of my favorite parts of uh, chapter 3. See, we must remember that this is the inspired Word of God from beginning to end. And he, he expects us to read through it and study and, you know, pick out those treasures in the books that he's given us. So, yeah. But we talked about Habakkuk 2 today, but verse 3, including that, says, Then the Lord, uh, then the Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets. So that the herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not provide false, or uh, be not prove false, though it linger, wait for it. That says it will certainly come and will not delay. See, I encourage everyone to read through it and, and not be afraid of what we see. And what we read. This really is a beautiful message for us. And one that, 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 is, that God is just wanting for us to study and understand. But as I decided what to preach about this morning, I, I was, well, I was, I, I like to say, I was very excited, but at the same time, there's just so much good stuff to talk about. I, I, I had to go back and ask God, what do you want us to talk about? You know, which one of these wonderful books do you want me to, or one of the, which chapters would you like us to talk about? Well, then, something come to mind, I read the great controversy. It says, the Bible is designed to be a guide to allow all who wish to become antiquated with the will of their maker. God gave to man sure word of prophecy. Angels and even Christ himself came to make known to Daniel and John the things that must shortly come to pass. Those important matters that, cert that, are, uh, that certain are salvation were not left to involve in mystery. They were not revealed in such a way as to perplex or mislead the honest seeker of the truth. It says they were not revealed in such a way. Oh, the word of sorry, the word of God is plain. To all those who will study it with a prayerful heart. There are a lot of wonderful treasures out there for us. And after reading just these few things in, in Revelation 5, I realized that this is the one that I want to talk about. And not because it's just one of my favorite chapters in this book, but it really describes some amazing things. So as I started to study and write the sermon, I started to see if 
Well, I started to see if a person that wanted to understand the book of Revelation, what they needed to do. And that comes back to what we said yesterday in Revelation 3. We need to see and understand the fundamentals, the fundamental truths that are found in this book. So regardless of the different views of interpretation, and what I mean by that is that we need to uh, ensure that we let the Bible interpret itself rather than listen to some commentator and what they have to say about it. And I believe, like I say, the main point of Revelation is found over in Revelation 1 verse 3. Because it literally says, Blessed is the one who reads out loud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it. Because the time is near. But when I read this verse, it literally is the basic message that John is trying to get out to everyone about this book. But maybe even the scriptures themselves. Because it says, and if you read and study, he says, you're going to be blessed by this book. But I, I'm also interested in the fact that John makes a point that says, don't just read it. But he says, read it out loud. In other words, don't keep this message to yourself. I mean, sure, it, well, sure, it's, it's a wonderful blessing to you when you read it. But we also find this is a, even a, it's even more of a blessing when you share it with others. Yeah. So as we're sitting here, and, and I'm thinking about this book, I said, John, you would think John would be in such a depressed state because at this point he's on the island of Patmos and he's in exile, but yet he still thinks he's blessed. He's in exile on Patmos because he was preaching the work of uh, the work that a Christian is supposed to do, and that was preaching the good news about Christ. And while there, God shows him what's going to take place. He saw the victory of Jesus at the second coming. He saw Christ establishing a new kingdom for, for an eternity for all those who trust him and are faithful. And in this book of Revelation, we are told that we should not fear it, but understand it. See, it's not written to, to make us fear the end time, but it's written to teach us that we need to be willing to study and understand God's end time message. And that is one of promise and vindication. This message is a message of love, a message of hope. But I think even more importantly, it's a message of vindication that His word is true. It's a message to the church to remain faithful. It's a message to, to remain on fire for the Lord. It's a message of judgment, though. But even more important than that is a message of hope for the church in John's day and even in our day as well. It was a message of telling us that even in time of persecution, we have something to look forward to. There's a promise that if we hold strong, and we stay true that we will join him in his kingdom. And a promise that there will be an end of the reign of evil upon this earth once and for all. But we also see this is a revelation which gives us, gives us guidance and comfort for the church throughout the times as well. You know, many have declared that it's a sealed book the secrets cannot be explained. But learning the name of the book is Revelation. And in Revelation 1, verse 1 and 3, it says, The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must take place. He made, no, uh, he made it known by sending his angels to his servant John who testifies to everything he saw that is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And then he, 
he brings us back to verse 3 and, and moves forward and tells us, blessed is those who, who, who read this out loud, the words of this prophecy, and are blessed, and, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart, what is written in it, because the time is near. This book in Revelation, well, it is a revelation of the judgment and vindication. And, and, but still we see that so many people refuse to even open the book. This book of Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ. It is about Him and His love for us. To show His servants the things that are shortly to come. So our passage here in verse in chapter 5 is part of the revelation that, that John witnessed and recorded for us. And I'm going to read the first ten uh, verses real quick of chapter uh, 5. But it says, Then I saw in, a great, uh, in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel pro proclaiming in a loud voice who was worthy to break the seal and open the scroll. But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside of it. You know, John says, I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside it. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, was, uh, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw the lamb, looking as if it had been slain. It says, Standing at the corner of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The Lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he, uh, when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the tw uh, twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a heart, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense which are the prayers of God's people. And they sung a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God's persons from every, from every tribe and language and people and nation, that you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve your God, and they will reign on earth. Hey, if you think about it, this is a beautiful scene here. Hey, what must have been what must it have been like for John to to literally be here and see all these things unfold? See, I'm not sure about you, but but if I had seen these things. I think I would have, re well, I guess I would have questioned if I would have rejoiced or been frightened. Because in verse 1, John sees these scrolls of judgment written up, and he sees written upon it all these things. He sees this is God's purpose and God's plan for his people. And with a loud proclamation, the angel cries out, Who is worthy to break the seals? But as we see in verse 3, he says, no one was found that, that was worthy enough to open it. So in verse 4, when John says that he wept, I believe John is not saying he just had a tear roll down his eye. I truly believe that when he says, I wept, that he fell to his knees, and he was so sad that he poured out his tears. Maybe kind of like that waterfall Charles was talking about. He meant that at this point he was falling down and crying out loud because he knew this scroll must be opened. And, and its contents revealed. 
But he said, who was worthy to take it and open these seven seals? But it didn't take long because one of the elders comes to him in verse 5. And he says, don't worry about that. There is someone worthy to open up this seal. He told John not to weep, seeing that the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, had triumphed. He said, he is able to open the scroll and the seven seals. See, Jesus is described as the Lion of Judah and the Root of David. But then we move over to verse 6, and we saw that Jesus is now seen as the Lamb of God. We're over in John 1, verse 29. Here's what John writes. He says, Then the next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So John says, looking as if he had been slain, as we move forward in Revelation in verse 6. He says, Even after his death and resurrection, even now the, the Heavenly Father has has a, a champion. And as John sees him, he still sees the marks and, and the scars from his death that he had suffered upon the cross. I love the a, a passage in the uh, Acts of the Apostles where it says the Savior is uh, presented before John under the symbols of the Lamb of the tribe of Judah and of a lamb as it had been slain. These symbols represent the union of the omnipotent power of a self-sacrificing love. The Lion of Judah, so, so terribly rejected uh, because of his, his grace, it says, yet he will be the Lamb of God to the obedient and the faithful. It says, pillars of fire that, that speak terror and wrath to the transgressors of God's law as a token of light and mercy and deliverance to those who keep his commandments. It says, the arm strong to smite the rebellious will be strong to deliver the loyal. Everyone who is faithful will be saved. And if we look over in Matthew 24, Verse 31, he says, He shall send his angels with great sounds, with the great sound of trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. We find that God, that Christ is a faithful, a faithful Savior. We find that he will, he will gather all of the all of those during those time of troubles and protect them and ensure that they do not have to suffer as the others. But then I think about that at the same time. What's going to be worse? Going through the plagues or doing those end time uh, tribulations or seeing your, fans, or your friends and family go through them? But in, in, chapter, in verse 7, Jesus takes the scroll as if, well, that, that, as if, his, if it was to be taken by him. And what I mean here is that he doesn't just take it by force or deception. He takes the scroll as if he was the one meant to take it. As if it was a scepter in the king's hand. And in verses 8 through 10, we see that there's a celebration of these four creatures and the 24 elders as they fall before Christ. And it says they sing a new song, holding the bowls full of the saints' prayers. I wonder if, if these, these prayers are not the prayers of like Daniel towards the end of captivity. When all the, the, the saints are praying with one voice saying, Lord, when are you coming? Please come soon. 
See, it is a, this song is a song about His worth, about His power, the, the, the power of redemption and, and the establishing of His of His kingdom here upon this earth. Think of us what it had been like for John to see this part of this revelation. It, it, it surely was encouraging for him as he sat there in exile, I'm sure, to see that there was victory just not that far away. But what do we learn from this passage about these prophecies? And then the predictions, even about Jesus and his second coming. Well, first we see that Jesus is, uh, as, well, he's predicted to be the lion of the tribe of Judah. See, the lion is the picture of Jesus as a strong and powerful ruler of all his people. He is from, the, he's from Judah and, and from the root of David, it says. Literally, it's a fulfillment of prophecy, isn't it? Jeremiah 23, verses 2 through 6. Say, therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flocks and driven them away, you have not bestowed care on them. I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. My friends, I think that is a prophecy even for today. For all of our, for all of our pastors. To ensure that we preach the truth. But in verse 3 he says, I myself will gather the remnant from my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their pasture where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them and they will no longer be afraid or terrified nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. He said, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will rise up from David a righteous branch, king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. It says, in this day Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. It says, this is the name by which you uh, will be called, Lord of our righteous Savior. See, these accounts record that the Messiah that he would look like a lion and that he would come from the, uh, from the, the root of David in Judah. But say we learn that Jesus is predicted to be a worthy Savior from it. I mean, verse 6 says that he's seen as a lamb standing in the center of the throne. Equal to and, and with, the, uh, with God the Father. And is encircled by all these heavenly beings. And even in verse 9, he, he says he is worthy because he was slain. A reference to his death upon the cross. His blood purchased men for God from every tribe, we're told. From every language and every people and every nation. But the third thing is that Jesus is predicted to establish a, a, an eternal kingdom. Over in verse 10. You know, as next quarter, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at these seven seals. And see what's to come to pass towards the end. But let's also not forget that these are all anchors of truth that we read in every chapter. You know, we can rely on, on the truth of scriptures and prophecies of Jesus Christ. We talked about that this week of how we can test the scriptures by looking at the prophecies and seeing the parts that have been fulfilled. 
and can walk away with insurance that if those are true, then we can trust the rest of, rest of that book. See, just as Scripture completely prophesies the first advent of Christ, being born of a virgin, to be, be, from, be from Bethlehem, to from Judah, the line of David, and so on, we can trust the rest of the Scriptures. So we can rely on truth of Scripture and the truth of prophecy. You know, the second coming literally was marked as a lion of the tribe of Judah who was a worthy Savior, and it was worthy to open the scroll to But we, we can take away that God's Word is truth because of these prophecies being fulfilled. And they're even able to test. But but we cannot, well, that we can count on God's word. And that it, it's amazing to me how, how people today rely on, you know, some person on television or on the radio or pick up a magazine at the grocery stand and think what they read about the future is true. But yet they never consider what's in the Bible as truth. Jesus is the Savior for all people. John 10, verse 7 through 10, literally says, Therefore Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep, and all who come before me are the me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. He says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. He says, the thieves come only to steal and kill and destroy. And I have come that they may have life and that they uh, and have it to the fullest. So Jesus, our Savior, is a worthy prince and worthy of our worship. So here we see that the, the heavenly beings, the four creatures, these 24 elders, are praising and singing and worshiping Jesus. We, we can learn that we need to take time and worship song and praise of our Heavenly Father. Jesus came down here and gave His life for each of us to ensure, ensure that we too can return home with Him. So the message I, I get from this chapter is that it's focused on Jesus who is the only one worthy of our praise and worthy of our worship. God's Word prophesied that Jesus would come as a babe in a manger, that he would die for our sins, that he would be raised from the dead, and then also that he would return and take us home. We, we know that he came like a lion with power and strength, and a sovereignty to, to rule a, an eternal kingdom that he himself will establish. I guess the question is, have you acknowledged Him through your faith? Have you acknowledged that He purchased your life by His death? Can you ask yourself, will you be there in that kingdom as Christ reigns upon this earth once again? When He comes again as the lion, Even if, even if you haven't made that decision up until today, he's saying there's still time. He says you can, you can turn to him today and accept him as your Savior. But he says he's not going to guarantee it tomorrow. 
like too many people that say that I will wait until my deathbed to accept it so that I can still be whatever I am today. Too many of them have, have lost the, the bet. Beloved, God is asking for you to turn to Him today, to accept Him as your Lord and Savior, and accept the truth that He has given us. The elder was going to sing a closing song for us. Look at her. Maybe she doesn't know that, but she does now. Mm -hmm. We have a loving Father, a loving Savior, and His only goal was to come down and make sure that you can go home. How can you find that He is not worthy of your worship, your praise, and your song? Even if we all can't sing like that.
but we should be like Walter and, and enjoy that book and, and, and make it personal and then read it out loud for each and every person to hear. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we're just truly grateful that we can be here to study your word, to, to see in our in what limited mindset that we have to, to, to see the kingdom, to see you and your, and your glorious reign. And Lord, we just ask that you prepare each and every heart here to, to be part of that kingdom so that we too can spend an eternity worshiping you. But Lord, we love you. We thank you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We have food. I like food. So let's see.